Are you recording this? Okay, cool. All right. Um, so let's see. Here's the schedule for the next hour and a half. Uh, feel free to leave if you're bored. <laughs> I won't be offended. Um, so I guess I allotted an hour, which is actually plenty of time, I think. Um, for this, I mean, we're talking about PCA, principal components analysis. Um, I have slides. They're semi-formal. Like, I think it's really a, there are a million ways you can explain it and understand it and talk about it. So this is just my launching part, launching point, so to speak. Um, so feel free to stop me if I'm not making sense. It may not make sense until we get all the way through. <laughs> and I actually coded up a little uh, example to make it a little more concrete. So we can talk about the conceptual stuff and then the programmatic stuff. And then if this is new to you, you may, it may not make sense until I'm done, but then you have to go back and cycle through <laughs> probably 10 times before you really understand what's going on. But we can do the best we can. Uh, sound good as a plan. So again, feel free to stop me, both real and Zoom people. So PCA is, I would say, I don't know if you would agree, it's basically a fundamental building block of many, many, many things. And so it's as fundamental as correlation or regression. And actually there's a whole hierarchy you can build. Like what is correlation is built on dot products. And what is a dot product is built on summation and multiplication. Anyway, so PCA is really in some sense, just a wrapper around singular value decomposition, which is a linear algebra concept. Um, anyway, so it's really fundamental and Therefore, it's important to really understand what it does. It, it, it itself is the building block for, well, <laughs> regression actually. And certainly other dimensionality reduction techniques are basically, you can think of this as this, the original, the OG. <laughs> okay, so um, now I guess the tricky thing about a PCA is there's many different ways to think about it. Um, and depending on what background and maybe even field you hear about it from and maybe described in different ways but which is cool but don't on the other hand don't get confused when you hear different terms and different ways of describing it um because they're all basically talking about the same thing okay so and it's very commonly used and that's probably you've heard of it so that's evidence that it is a common uh, procedure now in terms of like a method it has many appealing features uh it's fast to do I guess that's one appealing feature. Um, and it's it, it's based on very sound, I guess, statistical uh, principles, I guess you could call them that. Um, and often, you know, in a scientific talk, people will just say, you know, oh, we did PCA and here are the results. But there are definitely details to really, you know, how you set up the data, exactly what you're plotting, what units you're plotting, that they all sort of matter. Um, and typically it's not really explained, it's sort of, a, taken for granted that you know what they're talking about. Uh, so because it's not really explained uh, for time reasons really, uh, it may remain mysterious. So the goal here is to unravel uh, the mystery. Um, yeah, and as I said, there are many flavors of PCA, I guess, depending on how you set up the data. So you ideally would really understand how it was set up at the detail level. Okay. Um, this is one exposition of what it is. Again, there's many different ways to explain it. So you can think of it as a linear dimensionality reduction technique. So linear referring to sort of the flexibility of the types of operations it involves, and then dimensionality reduction referring to the idea of you might have high dimensional data and you might want a smaller number of dimensions of the same data. Of course, that may be lossy or you may lose some variance or information in the in reducing dimensionality, which is totally fine because you understand that you're doing that. And the main reason is we can only think about a few dimensions at a time often, or for computational reasons, you may only, you might can only fit 10 dimensions in RAM. So you can't analyze all thousands of dimensions. Uh, so it's basically in at least one view, a linear dimensionality reduction technique. And how, do, what's the basic format? Uh, it's quite straightforward. Actually, but some of you may have realized today, just getting your data set into a palatable form is actually a lot of work. So although the setup is easy, as you know, it takes a lot of work to get there and to know exactly what you're 
what, what type of numbers you're playing with. But we basically start with a 2D matrix or array, whatever you want to call it. And even the dimensions vary depending on the context. Here, I'm going to call the row dimension subjects, but it doesn't have to be actually humans. It can be neurons or voxels or channels. Um, so, or even the term, if you come from more statistical background, um, you can think of the rows as observations. So like samples from a population or something like that. So we have uh, subjects as the rows and features, again, statistical jargon, it's basically pretty much anything, any attribute, any property, anything, any aspect of the subjects that is of interest, right? So you might have a hundred subjects by 20 attributes where if subjects are humans could be different things you measure about the humans or in our imaging, it might be a hundred ROIs by 10 structural features. So I don't know, volume, surface area, cortical thickness. It, in some sense, it doesn't matter, right? Because PCA is just a mathematical tool. The type of numbers you put into it is up to you. So that's the basic setup right uh, here. And the basic idea is, and this is a very conceptual description. The idea is we can calculate the top and there's this idea of top. So they are ordered. So we're going to calculate the top three, top five, top 10, however you want, uh, principal components of this matrix. And you can think of the principal components as some linear combination of the features. So linear combination, meaning the features have weights associated with it. So it might be, if you have five features, the weights might be five, four, one, one, zero. So like most of the weight is on the first feature. So, but that's flexible, it learns that based on the matrix. So some combination of these features with some associated linear weights. And sort of the cost function that it's doing for you in a sense is to sort of account for variance in the data. And again, the data is literally this 2D matrix. So these matrix, this is a matrix of values, some are high, some are low. And so therefore there's variance, there's variability across these numbers. And the first PC, so the very top one, in a sense, and I know this is very conceptual, is accounting for, or you might use the word explains, although it's not explains in like a conceptual sense. Um, but the first principle component is responsible for the maximal variance in the data. So it's almost like if all you could do is retain one feature, what would it be to account for maximal variance in this 2D matrix? So there's a natural sense in which that's the most important thing. Like if you can only report one thing, what would you report? Probably the first PC. Uh, okay, so that's the first. And then the second the idea is almost iterative. It just goes on. The second PC is a different linear combination of features. So they have a different set of weights. And importantly, it's orthogonal, or in other words, uncorrelated with the first PC. So that's a criterion or almost a condition. Um, it's uncorrelated with the first PC. And of the all possible things that are uncorrelated with the PC, it's going to return you the one that explains the most remaining variance in that matrix. So this almost very, it should remind you of regression. You can fit a predictor and you get the residuals and then you're asking in a sense, on the residuals, how much, what can I do to maximize the variance that's left? And that's, that's sort of the concept here. And so that's the second PC and you can see this just keeps going on and on. The third PC will be orthogonal, or in other words, uncorrelated with both the first and second, and then it itself explains the maximal variance of what's left, and it keeps going until there's no more variance in the 2D matrix. That's the conceptual uh, thought. Does that make sense? Feel free to jump in. Um, and I'm sure you've seen this. You can look at the fall off, or because these are ordered, you can look at the singular values of this decomposition which are basically non-negative values. And they, in a sense, tell you this variance fall off. So how much variance does the first PC account for? And it's large. And then you can look at the next one and it gets smaller. And at some point it gets so small that most, for the most part, you kind of stop caring. And so that's motivates why you might want to concentrate on the top five or top 10 or however, however many uh, singular values seems to make sense for the matrix that you start with. Okay, um, and then one last conceptual way to do this is once you um, have the PC, so remember the PCs you can think of as 
linear combinations of the features, well, you have subjects that live in this feature space in a sense, subjects or voxels or regions or whatever. So one common thing to do is once you determine what these axes are, so I'm going to change terminology because axes mean like visualizations and it's very natural to look at, make the axes of your plot be pointed or represent the PC directions. And then what you could plot in like a scatter plot are the observations or the subjects. And that's a very common, and we'll see an example of this. Um, uh, and so that is useful because then you can kind of see structure in your data. And there's a lot of, you can learn a lot by looking at your data, obviously. <laughs> um, and so one, this is a very common uh, visualization strategy to uh, do. Okay, does that make sense, at least at some conceptual level? Okay, um, so a little bit of the, this gets more into arguably linear algebra. So it's, it's really just matrices. Hopefully that this will become natural or a reminder. Um, remember my data matrix, oh, I didn't say, okay. The data matrix here is X. So again, X is rows are subjects, columns are features, say. And one way to think about PCA is it's really just a way to use singular value decomposition and then interpret the results. So here I'm going to decompose this matrix X into three matrices, U, S, and V transpose. And the, uh, it's there just because it makes the nomenclature easy. So we'll see an example of that in a second. And this is just a matrix decomposition method. There are, I mean, it's classic, it's many. And so there are efficient ways to do this. And you know, you can do this in whatever programming language that you use, and it, it's, it's a straightforward uh, decomposition. Um, okay, so if you do that, why is this useful? Well, let's look at uh, what U, S, and V are. Okay, just to put numbers on this, 100 subjects, so, okay, subjects are subjects, whatever, 110 features. So once you do this decomposition, the magic lies in the U, S, and V matrices that you get. Okay, so the first matrix, the U matrix, um, there are some differences in the dimensionality. Here is the canonical way that decomposes. So just, just bear with me here. So U turns out to be 100 by 10. And I'm just going to read this because this is really, really critical to fully wrap your head around the, the nth column. So there's up to 10 columns. So let's just read this as the first column. So the first column consists of loadings on the first PC. Right, so think about the first column. It's a, just a vector, basically, or a one-dimensional array, or whatever. It's 100 subjects by one. So each of your 100 subjects will have a number, which I'm calling the loading. Again, terminology may vary, but I like the word loading. Um, so each of your subjects have some loading on this underlying dimension. So some subjects might, uh, I'm going to use metaphors, might really love the first PC, and they'll have a high loading, like 10. Other subjects might be and big ambivalent. So they might be have a loading of zero and then other subjects might have a negative loading, which means they actually love the opposite of the first PC. And I think I'll skip to a figure just to make that a little more clear what that looks like. But the idea is, right, the columns, there are 10 columns. So remember there are up to 10 PCs here. And the very first one is the loadings on the first one. And then if you look at the second column, you get the loadings on the next one and, and so on and so forth. Okay, that's um, you. S contains this fall off idea. So this idea that different PCs have different importance. S is a diagonal matrix. So it has only non-zero values on the diagonal. And importantly, the, the, that diagonal contains, in a sense, the relative importance of these different PCs. So the first, you know, S one comma one, the very first one uh, will be like a big number, 100. And the next one will be like 50 and then 10 and then they get smaller and smaller. Again, we'll see an example of this. So S tells you the relative importance of these 10 dimensions. And then finally we have V. So remember the decomposition is US V transpose, but if you just look at V, ignoring the transpose, um, it's 10 by 10 in this example. And again, think about the columns. So the very first column of V are, is now the set of linear weights. So remember I was talking about what is the first PC in this framework, you think of it as just a set of weights. So the very first column of V tells you the weights on the original 10 features you started with. And that those set of weights you can think of as the, the first principal component. So 
So let me let that sink in for a minute. This sort of making sense so far? Maybe I'll switch to a figure to kind of give you a figural uh, picture. Um, yeah, so let's fast forward to my canonical figure. <laughs> okay, here we go. So just focus your attention on the left, just ignore the right one. So on the left, we have, let's just imagine this is, a, I don't know, 100 dots. So 100 dots and there are only two features, and I made two because we can only visualize really two things, or you know, in a scatter plot. It's very hard to do a 3D scatter plot. But so our original data matrix was 100 by two, and I'm plotting you the data as in a scatter plot where each dot is a subject, and each subject has numbers associated with the two features. Here I'm calling them dimensions, but you know these words are interchangeable. So the red dots are literally just plotting the original data matrix I have. Right, very easy. And okay, then I'll explain the rest of this. So I'm labeling these two vectors here as arrows. And the first one is black, the second one is blue. And I'm plotting, let's consider first the first, let's consider first the black arrow. Uh, I'm plotting it as an arrow to kind of give the idea of a vector, but really PC1 is just a single point in this space. And so the tip of the arrow is I don't know, one comma point two. So those are the weights. Remember I keep saying the principal component you can think of as some linear combination of the original features. So in this figure, the PC, the value of PC one is just the numbers one comma one for the X axis and I guess point two for the Y axis and that's it. So if you were to do the SVD single value decomposition of these red dots, you would find that the first column of V is literally one comma point two, and I'm plotting it with an arrow just so you can see what it looks like. Okay, and then I can also do that for PC two, and that's this other vector, and that would be you know negative point one comma one something like that. Right now, the reason I did this is it's very natural what this is doing. Consider this black black arrow. It's the direction in this plot where the dots have maximal spread, right? We're trying to kind of explain or account for variance in these red dots. And so, you know, if the cloud was oriented a different direction, the PCs would start pointing that way. But here, the, the cloud is pointed this way. So that's why the principal component, as derived from the SVD algorithm, uh, points that way. Now, another observation is PC2 obviously uh, is perpendicular. So, okay, well, in this plot, you know, I have equal axes. I, I don't, you know, they're, you know, uh, 10 pixels is one in each dimension. So I did that deliberately so that you can see that the blue vector is perpendicular to the black one. So that's, that's just proving by eyeball the property of orthogonality. Good. Uh, blank stairs or like board stairs. That's what I'm trying to figure out here. Okay, <laughs> excited stairs too, yeah. Okay, so that's the visual um, analog. I won't, I'll explain that a bit later. So let's go back. But wait, there's more. There's some cool properties. Now that we've formally specified this decomposition, we can cover some very fundamental properties that's important to understand about this. So U and V, so these are the magical matrices. Um, they're both orthonormal. Okay, and that's just a fancy word for every pair of columns in U, as well as every pair of columns in B, they're orthogonal to each other. So uncorrelated, or you could also say the dot product is equal to zero. These are equivalent. Um, and also the length. So if you think of every column of U as a vector, that happens to have unit length. So the sum of the squares of all the values in that column is equal to one because the sum of the squares of all the values square rooted would be Euclidean distance and unit length means the distance of one. So it has some very basic, nice properties. Um, and in linear algebra sense, you can do it like this, U transpose U is identity, right? So because blank stairs, I'm not sure, but U transpose U is the dot product of every column of U with every column of U. And it turns out that's identity, meaning there's ones on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. The zeros everywhere else means that the dot product of every pair of columns is zero. 
you know, excluding itself with itself. And the fact that the diagonal has one means that the length of that vector is equal to one because, okay, I'm getting some nouns. <laughs> I don't know how much of the basics here. Um, anyway, so that this orthonormal property applies to both U and V magically, which is a little, it's not obvious why this is true. So it should be causing you to be thinking like, hmm, like we sort of said it conceptually, like we know the PCs are orthogonal, or at least we declared them to be so. So that's why V transpose V is not surprising. But it turns out U transpose U is also orthogonal, which is kind of important depending on how deep you want to go into this. Anyway, so that's one property, very important. I already mentioned S is diagonal. So it has very simple structure, right? It just is zero everywhere except for the diagonal. And we already mentioned this. We know there, there's a natural ordering to this, like the order of the columns matter because we want the diagonal elements of S to be in a nice decreasing order. And then this, I forget how many more I have. Oh, okay, there's many interesting mathematical facts. Okay, this is another one. So, okay, this is MATLAB no notation. So we can write the Python version if you like, but basically consider only using the first N columns of U and the upper N block corner of S and the first N columns of V. I could sketch this out, but hopefully you can use mental imagery to imagine. So I'm basically just deleting, you can just excise or omit columns, I don't know, four through 10, if we have 10, we're just retaining three. So you can literally just cut off those mat that part, these parts of the matrices. And if you do this multiplication, you get a matrix that's exactly the same size that you started with. So we can just talk that through. So if U was 100 by three, so 100 by three times three by three, you get 100 by three. And then if V was uh, uh, 10 by 10, but we chopped it off to 10 by three and transpose, it's just three by 10. So we end up by with the same size, 100 by 10. Now, okay, what do you do? The important thing is, and this is jargon that's important. It's it's this matrix you end up with is has low rank, meaning, well, <laughs> I forget the okay. It means okay, it means what it means. I don't want to give a definition that's wrong here, but clearly this 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 has very low dimensions, right? It's made up of three fundamental uh, dimensions, at least if n was three, and it's very useful because this is a sort of proof or a useful approximation that we can compress the original matrix, which might have rank 10, down to a thing that only has rank three, and we can usefully reconstruct or make a full data matrix that looks just like our original data, but it has very low compressed structure. This question? So our utility is that we can do take the first three pieces, that's what yeah, so I, I mean, there are many different ways you can do it, but like, let's say you have a method that wants to operate on subjects, like a hundred subjects by 10 features, like you want to operate on that, but you, for whatever reason, want to dimensionally reduce it. You could do SVD, select the first three, and then reconstruct that original data matrix, data matrix, and then just push that through the rest of your pipeline, for example. Because it, I mean, it has the same form as what you started with. So it's compatible with whatever analysis that you were planning to do would be one way. You don't have to do it that way, but that makes sense. Ish. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and then we just said that it is the data that you just are gonna push back through and have the same shape as the original data. So you said yeah. yeah. Question. Can I'm sorry? Can you yep, for sure. And actually, um, fine, let's just jump to that. Okay, now you'll have to switch gears because I want to visualize that because otherwise you'll lose the thought. Okay, so turned out I did some hacking. <laughs> so, uh, so what is this? This is NSD data. Um, let me show you. Again, if you don't read MATLAB, sorry, but so I have, for those of you who care about or understand NSD, it's subject one, it's the 1.8 volume preparation of the data. And 
I have, uh, this is actually not the NSD experiment, it's the localizer experiment, it's the category. So there's 10 categories of these grayscale thingies. And it's an fMRI experiment, it's already been pre-processed, it's been fit using a GLM, and I'm loading here the, the betas in that experiment. Uh, turns out it's, it's pretty, uh, the structure is simple once it's done loading. I have, um, you know, XYZ dimensions at 1.8 millimeter resolution, and then I have 60 betas. These are, there's 10 categories, and I, the way I analyzed it, I get six trials per category. So it's actually a six by 10 structure, all right? But anyway, so it's not terribly important, but it helps to have a little bit of context um, for what we're gonna play with. Here are just some ROI labelings that I'm loading in. Um, don't worry about uh, this too much. This is just wrangling the data. Okay, so finally I get to the point of the data matrix. So remember 2D matrix. So I have apparently in this, so I'm selecting voxels from uh, ventral stream. Don't worry too much about how that magically happened, but I have 4,500 voxels. Uh, 60 trial responses. Okay, so first thing first. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, let me just do that. Let's just look at it. So I take the data matrix, let's just eyeball it. So it's a little small, but um, again, 4,500 different voxels. The units are percent signal change. Um, here I'm not, I'm, I'm, there are some voxels that go crazy, like 30% and they're real. They're actually near the big vessels. Um, uh, okay, yeah, not much to say other than I noticed that some voxels are quite extreme. Um, we could simply L2 normalize each voxel, uh, this is sort of an aside. So if I go ahead and do that using a function and I replot the data, it looks like obviously we can see more. Um, most voxels are positively responding. There's some blocky structure here. Again, they're organized six trials, 10 categories. You can already see some of this blocky uh, structure, which is reassuring. Um, anyway, so again, this is a, uh, this is real data. It's a sample data. Um, and I'm going to play with the L2 normalized. So each voxel's set of 60 betas have been rescaled such that the sum of the squares of all the betas is one. It's actually the same concept we talked about a second ago. All right, so we have this data matrix and um, it looks like this. And let me just skip to the punch line to, to connect to your question. So notice I just did SVD on this 2D matrix. Uh, this is just a flag, by the way. Um, and the reason I'm going through all this uh, rigmarole is to show you this thing. So don't worry about what the code says, but just look at the picture. And then I can show you the code. Um, this is the rank one reconstruction of the this Zoom window is really annoying. Okay. Um, oh, my, was there a minus sign? Maybe that. Anyway, okay. If this is the rank one reconstruction, it looks aesthetically pleasing. And then as I increase the number of, so I'm looping over rank one, rank two, rank three, and eventually it starts looking like the original matrix. So I guess I'll leave the original matrix up there. And then I'll just do this again. So this is one, whoops, shoot, 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 sorry. So this is using one and you know, everything's fixed here. I'm not changing the color range. It's just numbers. This is rank two. It already has a lot of the structure, interestingly, by, at least by eye. Then this is rank three, rank four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. I mean, <laughs> visually speaking, it looks like all the good structure is basically done by maybe five. So one, two, three, four, five, maybe six, seven, nine, ten. Oh, that's obviously very much a guess. But um, anyway, but that was my figure answer to you can still do it with one. So in other words, this is this is still valid. I mean, this used okay for num equals one. This is one based index. <laughs> We're using a single column of u and a scalar, a single number in S, and a single column of V to reconstruct this 2D data matrix. And it, the math works and it's valid. Um, I guess it's hard for me to comprehend because it's so little information you can just reconstruct so much. Uh, interesting. So the question was, 
how does this actually work? Can we act, how do we actually explain so much variance with just one? Uh, okay, let me skip to a figure. I mean, it's not magic, like it is what it is, but there's this idea. So now I'm jumping to this figure um, to give you a visual interpretation of how this works. So again, we have a cloud of points. I don't know, there's like 20 points in two dimensions. And this is our, our original, uh, you know, 20 by two matrix, right? So in this context, it's a little different from regression. Regression, you have a dependent variable and you're interested in variance of that dependent variable and not the predictors. Here, we just have a 2D matrix. This is actually like unsupervised learning in the machine learning sense. But, um, but anyway, so in this context, I draw, drew little lines between each data point and the origin, because in this context, variance is how far you are from zero, basically. If that makes sense. So this is my visual depiction of variance. So there's a lot, there's some variance in this data. Great. Now, what does PCA say about it? Well, I have two scenarios here. So consider the one on the left. What I'm drawing for you here is I picked somewhat random, a random direction. So these green dots are obviously almost vertical. So there's a there's a there's a vector here pointed almost perfectly vertically. And I'm plotting for you in green, the projection of all the original data points on this vector. Projection meaning like, hopefully you know what this is. It's like, it, it's like the heart of regression. When you regress a bunch of predictors on a dependent variable, you're basically finding, okay, <laughs> I was gonna use a bunch of jargon. It doesn't matter, but you can just think of uh, dropping down a line that hits perpendicularly this green line. Okay, so if you project the original data on this somewhat randomly chosen green vector, you can see, and then now I'm showing you the black and black, just how far you have to go to travel to that projected point. There's a lot of black here, right? There's a lot of variance we haven't dealt with. Okay, and it, okay, and then it sounds like you get the idea. So here I just do it again, but I'm now choosing the vector that happens to be the first principal component of the original data. So this is a vector that is large, you know, it's like 30 degrees above zero in the Cartesian sense. So it's, it has a very specific direction. And if you drop down the, and you look at the projection of the data points on this uh, vector, they're very small. Like there's not much distance to travel. So the black in this panel is basically the remaining variance and there's not that much. Whereas in this case, there was a lot of remaining variance. Right. So in some sense, PCA, you know, it's optimizing some cost metric. It's, it's minimizing, it's maximizing the variance that you can get away with by capturing from the first PC and leaving the minimal variance left. So the answer to your question is, how does it work? It, it does what you asked it. Like uh, in terms of, in this example, data set, like, well, <laughs> Well, okay, here's an intuitive way to think of what, why this might work. Why is it that one dimension does a lot of the work? It could be that all the voxels in this part of the brain respond the same way to the stimuli, right? If they all, I mean, and sorry, to be clear, there's a critical thing here with um, things, it doesn't have to be literally numerically identical. Scaling, multiplication is okay, right? So if you have a voxel that responds one, two, and four to three different stimuli, the next voxel can respond two, four, and eight, if I did the math right. <laughs> and from that point of view, the, they're identical, just up to a scale. And from PCA's point of view, scales are fine. Like you can, the, the loadings, if you remember that, are the scalings. So it, it allows each subject or voxel to have a scaling and that, that's its flexibility. So anyway, to get to your point, so in the data set, if all the voxels are basically showing the same response profile uh, up to a scale, like scales are fine, then yeah, one PC is all you need. And it could be that all the remaining variance is just noise, right? It, it's, it's plausible that this might be. Okay, good, 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 good. Okay, let's go back to the fundamental facts about PC. By the way, the slides are somewhere on GitHub or something where you can just download it. Um, and then maybe, okay, two more things. And then <laughs> we, we talked about this a little bit, um, but some of the details, yeah, if you wanna quantify um, this sort of 
uh, variance explained plot. In the way I set it up, you actually have to square the values on the diagonal, and then you express them in, with respect to the sum of all of those values, and that, that, that gives you percentages. So we can do that really quick for our simple example. Uh, if you can read code quickly, I mean, it's, there's not much going on. I'm just extracting the diagonal. I square them all, and then I'm cumulatively summing them and expressing them as a fraction relative to the total. Easy. So for this uh, example, it looks something like this. Not the prettiest plot, but um, so remember, in this case, I have 4,500 voxels, 60 features. And so I have 60 bars here, and this is the cumulative sum of all the squares of the singular values, which times 100, and basically it's percentages. So if you use all 60, you hit 100. If you use one, you're already at 42, roughly. Now, you know, this the shape of this is often of interest. Sometimes it's like rapidly rising and then basically flat. This is actually fairly gentle. Like this slope is fairly gentle, gently rising. Um, so yeah, looking at this, there's no quote natural place to cut this off, which is something people typically do. But I mean, it is what it is. You can just say, what's five looks like it accounts for most of it. Uh, it really depends on the context. Anyway, okay, so maybe the last mathematical conceptual point here is there is a sign ambiguity. So that's really important. Um, so let's go back to the simple figures to explain the sign ambiguity. So again, consider the plot on the left, consider the black vector, the first PC. In think about it in terms of what's the cost metric that this is optimizing. It's just trying to find the vector direction that points towards most of the data, basically. And if you flip that vector through the origin, so mirror reflect it, it would have no effect on the cost metric. Because if the black vector was placing facing the lower left, that vector is allowed to scale itself, right? The projection idea. You're allowed to go both forward and backwards. So it doesn't really matter whether it starts off pointing to the right. It starts off pointing to the left, and then you can get to the right just by multiplying by negative one. So no big deal. So anyway, so there's a sign ambiguity. So when you apply the singular value decomposition, you basically get a you, the columns of V, their sign is basically random. Like if you ran it again or add epsilon to one of the data values, you might actually flip the sign of some of the columns in V. So don't get confused by that. And it's... Uh, but it can bite you in the butt, like if you're not careful about what you're trying to quantify. Um, okay, that's just something to watch out for. Does that make sense? Okay, go back to the math. All right, let me check my time. So what time is it? Four, so I have like 20 minutes, I think, according to, okay. Um, Okay, let's just slog through some math because if I have 20 minutes, I don't think I have, okay. Um, okay, the data matrix is X. So remember where we declared because SVD works that X can literally equal USV. And this is like a unique decomposition for X, unique up to this sign flip, asterisk, right? Right, so if X is literally equal to USB transpose, there is an important observation that if we look at X transpose X, and you just work through the matrix uh, in your algebra stuff here, it simplifies to VS squared. So this is the square of the that diagonal matrix S, uh, V transpose. And the reason I bring this up is, you know, depending on which version of PCA or how you think about the implementation, this is a very natural way to put it. Um, Basically, you do SVD of this X transpose X thing, this, this object, this, I'm going to call it, it's a, almost a covariance matrix um, up to a normalization. But if you do SVD on this thing, X transpose X, you're going to get the same V, again, up to a sign flip. This is sort of an important observation, depending on how deeply you want to understand this. Um, but X transpose X is a very interesting object. So again, think, think back in reality. So X is subjects by features. What is X transpose X? It's features by features. 
right? So it's it's kind of like the correlation of every feature with every other feature. So that's basically conceptually what X transpose X is, and that's a very important object in statistics. Um, yeah, I don't. This is you can read that. I'm not sure how important it is to dwell on it. Okay, so let's let's talk about some more practical issues. Um, and sometimes we just saw this very quickly. I went through it very fast, but it really matters how you prepare your X matrix, your data matrix, right? Your subjects by features matrix. So a common thing you may run across and very useful, if you, depending on the context, is like you might want to normalize your features, right? So if, if your features are like age and weight, like they're not comparable, like they're on different units, you can measure age in days or months or years, like it, it makes no sense. So a common thing to do is like take each column and z-score them, right? So what is z-score doing? You're discounting each column's mean, and sometimes you don't care, so you center them on zero, and then you scale it to have unit variance. I mean, that's what z-scoring is. So it's kind of fixing this dynamic range of each of the features. So it's very common to do that. I don't want to say you should always do that because it changes things. Um, and, and the other direction, those are columns. Think about the rows. So each subject, sometimes you might want to normalize your subjects. And in fact, we just saw that in this little fMRI example, we had 4,500 voxels by 60 different experimental trials. I did this funny L2 normalization of each voxel under the intention that I actually don't want the high responding voxels to dominate. So I'm sort of scaling them down. So, I mean, that's up to me and it's fine as long as you know what you're doing. Um, and so that's an example of normalizing the rows of this data matrix. And again, you got to be careful. You got to make sure you're doing what you intend. Um, and in that case, the, the normalization of the voxels, that did not involve an additive normalization. That was, lit, that was just a scaling, right? I, I'm preserving the zero point because I might be interested that, well, zero basically means no response, like baseline, like you're just staring at a fixation cross and that's my zero point. So I didn't want to change the zero point and that's this circumstance. So I only scaled the rows. Okay, so whatever you do prior to setting up the data matrix, it's going to change the answer of PCA. Like it, and there, there's nothing, there's no deep reason here other than you've changed the numbers, the answers will change, right? Um, that's basically the point. Again, you can read this. Um, and yeah, I think the important point is you shouldn't blindly normalize your data. You should really think about what assumptions or what you're really doing to the data. Uh, so in other words, you wouldn't just blindly z-score your features all the time. Like it, it really depends on how you want to prepare your, uh, your, your, your data. So anyway, that's basically what I'm saying in, in these bullet points here. Any questions so far? I think we're pretty much to the end. I have some, probably a few more discussion points, but let me pause for any like, General questions about where this might be going or what might this might remind you about. Yep. That's the right way to think about it. And, <laughs> and maybe link it back to this figure. So right. this, I mean, the data example is not massively correlated, but clearly there's a high correlation between feature one and feature two. So exactly that. So that will show up in X transpose X. So I didn't explain it, but X trans, if you, so again, uh, subjects by features, if you take each column and subtract the mean and make it unit length and then do X transpose X, that those values are literally correlation values, like Pearson correlation values. So in this data example on the left, it'll be a correlation of like 0.6. So the fact that your features are correlated in this example bears out in the PCA result. So if you only had one dimension to use, it literally will be a linear combination of your two features and it will reflect their inherent correlational structure. Yeah. Okay. Any other uh, 
questions? Okay, so this goes back to my point that there are many different cool uses of it, and but they're all sort of related to one another. So it just, I guess, don't get confused. So the one I started with is dimensionality reduction. So in machine learning, you might have 50,000 potential features. You don't know which ones are important and your computer's not big enough to build a model that uses 50,000 features. So in the absence of any smarter thing to do, you might as well just do PCA and choose the top 50, right? So it's, it's very practical and useful from that standpoint. Um, it's also useful that idea for inter interpretation. If you have 500 different manipulations in your experiment, it's very hard to interpret 500 different things. So maybe you should reduce it and you'll have easier time making sense of the data. Um, summary, interpretation, summary, these are somewhat related. Um, I don't know if I have much to say about that. Oh, visualization. So that's actually, I would say that's a qualitatively distinct thing we like to do as data analysts. Um, here, I guess the point of visualizing your data is to maybe discover structure you didn't know was present um, or, and or validate that you understand the units of your data. Like some subjects are 100, some subjects are 10, and that's, you wanna check that that makes sense. So anyway, so visualization, it's, it's, it's very useful. Uh, so let me show you an um, example of that. So again, going back to this fMRI example, we have 4,500 voxels, that's a lot. And we have 60 trials, that's actually a lot also. Um, so one thing we can do is, um, so remember I've already decomposed my data matrix into US and V. So rewind your brain like 20 minutes. What is U? These are loadings. So each of my subjects, which are voxels actually, my voxels have different loadings on these principal components. So what I want to visualize now is just, I'm just scatter plotting the first column of U against the second column of U. Now, the first thing you probably see is this funny rounded structure. That's actually a somewhat of artifact of the normalization. So actually don't put too much stock in that. Don't worry, don't worry about it. Um, but each dot here, just to be explicit, each dot is a voxel. And we're looking at how each voxel loads on the first two principal components of this data matrix. And remember, these are 60 different visual categories, basically. And so there's some, well, the, we can just look at it. Um, what I call the PCs are in the V matrix. So I'm here, I'm just looking at the first column of V. And so there's, well, I actually have a plot for this. So let me, <laughs> let me just run my code. Okay. Um, just for explanatory purposes, I'm plotting actually the second. So just bear with me for a second. So this is the second principal component. It's a set of 60 numbers. And I'm just showing you what they are. And now I'm putting natural vertical lines because I, I control the experiment. I know what these 60 numbers are. The first six is very small, sorry. This is from a word category. There's six trials of random words being shown on the screen. The second six are, are numbers. This is bodies and limbs, and these are adult faces, child faces. Anyway, so that's the underlying experiment, of course. But you can already see these are not random numbers. They have structure that follow the natural structure of the experiment. Basically, these trials are basically all measuring supposedly the same thing. So it makes sense that the loadings, uh, sorry, the, the weights of these six that come from adult faces are all very similar in size and so on. Okay. so. This being the second principal component, if we go back to this plot, uh, I'm plotting um, the loading on the first against the loading on the second. So this, this visualization corresponds to the y-axis here. So it's basically, intuitively, how much does each voxel look like this selectivity pattern? Notice, okay, what are the extreme loadings? Uh, uh, sorry. Ex extreme weights in here. So adult faces and child faces. So faces, everyone's favorite <laughs> cognitive thing. Um, so the weights here are negative. So if a voxel loads strongly on this thing, it hates faces, basically. It responds very weakly to faces. And if a voxel has a negative loading on PC2, which is what we're visualizing, it's the reverse. They have responses that are positive to faces, basically. 
So in this plot, um, some voxels, you, you can't read this, I know, zero is here, positive values are above, negative values are below. Um, negative means negative of this thing, which means space preferring. Just accept that. And one last thing I'm, I'm plotting here, just send me prove the point is, uh, there's two colors of dots. Obviously you notice this. The red dots are, it's a little circular, but these are the voxels deemed to be in the face selective regions of ventral cortex. So FFA and other regions. Okay, so it, those regions were actually derived from these data. So it's circular, so it's not like an empirical finding, but I'm just showing you that everything makes sense that the red dots tend to be negatively loading on PC2. In other words, they're at the bottom section of this plot. Okay, but that was right. Don't don't forget the big point, which is visualization of the data. This was just one example of we can start doing scatter plots. We can't visualize 60 dimensional space, but we can visualize two dimensional space, and we might as well choose the top PCs to be the axes of our low dimensional scatter plots. And certainly, we can do 3D scatter plots, but it gets very complicated. So this is. PC1, PC2, BC, PC3, and trying to understand the 4,500 voxels. And yeah, you have to rotate this around. And then, yeah, it gets, it gets hard already in three dimensions, but um, there's definitely structure. And just to be clear, this is very complex structure. This is not like a Gaussian ball. This is some other shape. Um, and maybe, is this the end? Oh, well, let me see how many more slides. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, and maybe one last important point is, it's actually reminiscent of what we were just staring at. The point is that the PCs you get out from doing SVD, singular value decomposition, they, they don't necessarily have any true meaning, like in some deep sense. Again, they're literally just minimizing that cost metric. You're trying to point in the direction that or maximize, uh, maximizing the variance in the data. So it just comes out with something. It's not like that's a necessarily like a biological structure, which often can be <laughs> overlooked and people start putting real weight on the PCs, but they might help you find such structures, but it in and of itself doesn't guarantee anything. Okay, that's basically it. Um, there's some more mathy, crazy stuff. There are many different cool mathematical ways to think about what PC is doing. Obviously, we don't really have time to try to even go there, um, but you can read this. Um, you guys have any questions? We're running pretty good on time. Right. So to be clear, we're talking about U. So U, the columns of U, the first column of U are the loading of all the subjects on the first PC. So you're talking about the rows of U. Yeah. The rows of U are a single subject or voxels loading on the various PCs. So yeah, there's no constraints on the numbers in the rows of you. They can be all positive, they can be all negative. They can... Um, yeah, we already went through all this. That's good. Um, let me just see if there's anything else I wanted to show in this little simulation. Uh, yeah, okay, so obviously not much. Most of the work was like loading and visualization. I mean, in the end, under this conceptualization, it's really just, well, one line of code, right? An application of a decomposition method. Um, the, the, the magic is in understanding what it does and plotting your data and interpreting your data appropriately. 
okay i mean that's really all i had to say about pca i think the meta point here which is the reason i made this is not only i mean it's fundamental and it it requires a lot of thinking actually to really understand what it's doing and so if you're applying this to some complex data set you hopefully understand the tool that you're using to analyze a complex data set if you don't understand the tool then you're doubly in the dark <laughs> because the data are complicated but hopefully the tools we use are simple so that we can make sense of the complicated thing with understandable tools good happy um i kind of have a question i'm here over zoom okay i mean yeah. again that's that's just pc of course there's a zoo of more complex versions of PCA, and then there's ICA, which is sort of different, and then nonlinear PCA, all this other stuff. Um, so that there's a lot, obviously, a lot more um, out there. Um, but yeah, this is the <laughs> I would say the foundation for all of that. Okay, so um, in the rest of the time, feel free. I mean, if you don't want to stick around, that's totally fine. Uh, this was more just. There's so many things that go on, in, let's say in fMRI. So NSD includes, the bulk of NSD is an fMRI experiment, task-based, so to speak. I mean, there were sting line, whatever. Um, and as many of you probably know, there's uh, a lot of complexity in how the field generally takes fMRI data and pre-processes, visualizes, uh, summarizes, vi uh, all this stuff. Um, and certainly NSD, if you care about that data set, I mean, the paper talks about all of these things. It, you know, there's an infinite many ways to do it. We do it one kind of way, I mean, to some degree. We also prepare the data in multiple forms. So, but yeah, so we do it a certain way. And these are interesting topics. I, I, I'm happy to talk about or show you images or explain what we did in NSD or talk about the issues more broadly, um, if there's anything that, specifically of interest to you. Like, so feel free to just say like a phrase and I can tell you more about it. And maybe that can spawn some, like some aspect of this large processing tree. Single, single subject analysis. Yeah, so I guess the first thing that comes to mind is um, it's like, how do you quantify error or reliability? You know, like you, you look at one subject, how do you know what you're seeing is like real? Like the minimum bar is reliability. And in the context of NSD and many cognitive experiments, I suppose that comes from uh, either, well, it fundamentally comes from trials, I would say. You, know, you have the subject do a thing, and typically you have them do it again later. We hope that they're a good subject. In, do cognitively what they were doing the first time. Uh, so that's the idea of trials. And then, of course, trials are typically embedded in like runs or scans, like five minute blocks or whatever. And then that's embedded in like a scan session. And sometimes you have multiple scan sessions. Uh, so you can treat that very really like you can analyze one session and then analyze another session. And if the results basically look the same, which would be nice, uh, then you're at least crossing the bar of reliability. Doesn't mean that it's correct, but it's at least reliable. <laughs> uh, and that can be applied to any analysis, right? You could plot a map, frame map of whatever, and then do that from a distinct set of trials or a distinct session. You can apply to some connectivity matrix, so to speak. You can make one and then make it again from the same subject. And I guess the power of that is, I mean, it, it cuts to the really important topic of people are different. So why are we like, how do we pool data across people if people are different? Right? Do you average draw voxel activity? But then there's questions of like, what atlas do you align them with? Or if you want to define regions, the question is like, how do you do that well? Or what if a, what if a person fundamentally has different brain computations? <laughs> then how do you even average that person with other people? So anyway, so in that context, if you're thinking about single subject analyses, you don't you avoid those issues in some sense, right? You can look at one person's brain and very precisely quantify their 
blah, 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 whatever it is you're going to write. And at least you know that you know that person. <laughs> and you can actually know one person well and know one person well and know another person well. And if they're very different things, maybe you can just stop it. Just be like, hey, this person, they have five regions and this other person, they have three. And that's life. <laughs> it's a little unsatisfying, of course, but um, anyway, so that, that's sort of the context in which I thought about this issue. What are the interesting information at fMRI provide? <laughs> what interesting information would the market provide? Yeah, um, the primary advantage is coverage, whole brain. Right? Whole brain have reasonably high spatial resolution. It's from this observation first and foremost, as one thing that it provides. How would that be better than a high resolution structure on the one I have? Question. So, a structure, what is structure? Structure is on the neuron, I have a cell membrane, and I stay in one place. So, like number of cells, density of cells, the shape of my dendrites, the types of neurotransmitters I use. I guess that's structure, although that's kind of magic. It's used in and out rapidly. So, that structure is one thing. But yeah, it depends on your theory of how the brain works. Maybe structure is the most important thing and all this spiking and synaptic activity and communication that occurs dynamically and none of that matters. <laughs> um, you know, it depends on the question, of course. Like, as you've seen, like many people quantify structural properties, brain out of volume, trajectory over time, and relate that to phenotypes or other, you know, very high level behavioral things. Like, you can do that. And these are probably real associations. If that's satisfying to your scientific question, great. If you want to, if that's unsatisfying to you and desire something deeper and more mechanistic, to use a little word, then that probably leads you down the functional route. It's an important question. I mean, if there's a reliable relationship between brain outer volume and your favorite brain region and some behavioral performance, like, I guess why? <laughs> is more neurons better? Is less neurons better? Whichever way it is, why? Why is it better? That you know, you might think it's how the neurons are dynamically communicating with one another. Maybe that's is that what you're looking for? I'm not sure. Do you have thoughts on this? Yeah, I think I think a great example of where FMRI is great. Uh, you, you need FMRI as your structure. There's like all of the new corpus for that. That's a lot of that you're actually giving us. And we were pretty sure that those maps correlate structure, but they're not structure. And we wanted to show the problem solvers, but we can't get your training at the that what we wanted to find out. So if you want to put any trail on that there, it's not that where you need to have high spatial I mean, I, oh, yeah, I agree 100%. Like, it's sort of argument via maps. We know maps are real and probably really important, and the only way to get those is to measure, I think. But, there, I mean, arguably, or at least the more traditional argument would be what is the brain good for other than computing? Computing involves sensory things. That's like a functional concept. Like, receptors, photoreceptors. I mean, if you measure the structure of the photoreceptor, great, but like, What's probably important is how it transduces light into signals. And that's like a functional concept. But in the end, it depends on what piece of the vast pie you're interested in writing the brain. Uh, but yeah, good question. You can also ask what is structural structure? 
I mean, I, I'm not even going to just do what we don't care at all about. Drain patterns, areas, you know, just take the same old thing. I mean, is that the full registration? Yeah, for some people, it's just, yeah, 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 the neurons live in this area, and that area is kind of in the back of the brain or in the front. But beyond that, it's not that important. Yeah. What is B or L V in the head? Oh, bold. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this is the first time this time. We should spend more time on this. So, bold stands for blood oxygenation level dependence. So, that's part of that. Blood. Uh, oxygenation is what your blood carries, importantly. Good for keeping cells alive, I suppose. Uh, so it's a it's an oxygenation dependent thing. So it's it's a phenomenon that occurs. In short, I guess we're not going to talk too much about homework physics, but in short, the um, blood lives in your vessels. Sorry, it doesn't work. Blood flows through your vessels. The oxygenation content of the blood affects the strength of the local MR signal, and it does so because of its magnetic properties. So think about a magnet that's like really strong and it's like disrupting the magnetic field. And depending on how much is disrupting or not disrupting the strength of the MR signal. So in the end, by the way, um, MRI is normally done, so not MRS, which is a totally different thing. Is basically measuring what, uh, the strength of hydrogen, which is predominantly carried by the water. So it's basically measuring water, but the, the it, it's basically modulating the water signal. So various factors modulate that. So the blood oxygenation level is one factor that will modulate the intensity, like how bright the pixel is on your brain screen. That's that's literally what we're all doing when we do fMRI. So it just so it turns out the blood has this nice property. And just so it turns out, the blood is fairly tightly ish linked to dynamic changes of neural activity. And because of all this, we can measure this thing and then analyze big data sets. That was that was MRI in a nutshell. <laughs> There's obviously a lot more. Uh, but the more important point is it's fundamentally a vast a human neural thing, a blood thing. Whereas uh, other there are other ways to use MRI, so structural MRI is not just fundamentally the way. Yep. What is positive bold and what is negative bold? <laughs> uh, okay, so conventionally people define positive bold as like you're sitting there resting or looking at a gray screen or whatever, and then experimenter causes the participant to do something or respond to something or see something and that rises the bold signal. That's like one definition of what it. So it's actually relative to what is baseline, which is actually leads to all sorts of default mode network and all this other stuff. But if that's the definition of positive bold, the definition of negative bold is just the reverse. You're sitting there just resting in the have Now so you do something and for whatever reason the bold time course will go to the So <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that's not what you're asking for. You're asking so that, what is exactly what I was asking for. Okay, that's all it is. As for why, like what's the causes and factors that contribute to it, that's more rich. Like maybe I get involved with some artifact of blood stealing, or maybe it's a real neuro-related phenomena. Well, so that, that would be a different discussion. So does that mean when you're reset first, it doesn't end where it's more blood flow in the brain and that increases the signal? Yeah, sorry, I didn't get into in my one minute description of bold. Um, so yeah, the blood itself has the three main players are flow. Actually, I'm just saying the blood. I don't really know that much. But flow is has some physical unit, so it's probably like milliliters per second, maybe. Uh, <laughs> so there's CDF, serial blood flow. There's uh, CDD volume, so it's just like how big is your pipe. Bigger your pipe, the more liquid you fill in it, I suppose. That's probably some physical unit. And then there's CMR02, so oxygen metabolism rate. So that's like somewhere in the head, right? But anyway, those are three different quantities, distinct physical things. And the combination of those three things at any given point in time contribute to what your goal signal level is. So people just 
Importantly, say, oh, it's just more blood flow, but it's not a simple term. It's actually volume. CBB can change. Your capillaries get more, uh, change their CBB, but your larger veins don't. They're like more rigid. So the pipes are like just, the pipes don't grow, but I think the capillaries can grow to some extent. So it's a complicated, it's not just blood flow, it's a combination of multiple uh, vascular. Um, I just had a general question about analysis and like why we use stigmatic analysis, like heart rate and yep. respiration sure. analysis, and yep. what they do. And also, like, if you have a path that increases your heart rate per se, can you lose that like path based increased variation when you're incorporating the variation? I just like kind of wrap my head around. Yeah, so the question's about physiological factors and how does that show up in fMRI basically I think uh, hmm, where do we even begin so I'll just show you some figures just for fun so in NSD we did record physiological data for a significant fraction of the session so this is like a, I think 12 five minute runs basically and this is a trace of the respiratory so if you've been in the scanner you can strap on this little belt it's pretty snug and when you breathe in it squeezes something, some pneumatic, anyway, <laughs> I don't know what it is, but it, it, it attracts your uh, lungs or your chest cavity stuff. <laughs> and so this is just a plot of the raw data um, from one subject in one scan session. Anyway, so this is respiration. It looks very well behaved. And so, yeah, okay. So one thing to note is this is really clean data. <laughs> um, and yeah, actually, in the last run, we told the subject, and this was advised to us by someone who does a lot of this, we asked the subject to deliberately take a huge breath. And lo and behold, we see this big uh, up and down fluctuation. So that's a good sanity check. Um, and so unlike fMRI, which is horribly noisy, you can see every breath here. There's no, no one will doubt this, at least for this. Of course, data quality can get questionable. I'm sure I can find. Uh, yeah, this one is a little weird. There's lots of oscillations. I'm not sure I would trust this. Anyway, so let, let's go to good data. We like good data. Okay, there you go. So in this case, um, one thing you can already see is that there are certain points in time where there's a large... They take a deep breath for whatever reason, right? And yeah, this shows up in bold, 100%. Because when you breathe, you get a lot of oxygen. And if you hold your breath, you build up CO2, I guess, and di diminish oxygen, I suppose. And this is directly reflected in the bold signal. So there's a global, and people, if you just Google this, you'll find it. If you hold your breath, it's hypoxia. So the bold signal will just go way down. And so this is a massive effect. And yeah, if your subjects are evil, they will breathe deeply and hold their breath and cause massive signal changes. <laughs> And it'll show up in your data and yeah. <laughs> now the, the real question is what, what do you do about it or how you prevent it? Or, um, yeah, that's a harder, harder, but you know, if you have measures like this, so if you actually take the time to strap that on your subject well and your scanner allows this and you shepherd the data along, yeah, you could maybe use this and people do and there's different proposals of trying to use this other data source to correct or adjust or whatever um, your fMRI data. It can get tricky, but it can work to some degree. Um, that's that's respiration. Cardiac, it's you you have less under your control, I, I think. I don't know if some people can control their heart rate, but <laughs> um, but yeah, but it gets complicated. So I don't want to say it's horribly just negative thing. Like if the experiment causes panic in you, is it the experiment causing you to panic, which causes your heart rate to increase, or is it just like what's the causal chain? Like it's not clear. It may be an interesting causal change, not not a confounding causal change. Um, but the heart rate obviously is at a very different frequency, so you have to think about is it. Well, let me just show you the heart traces, um, cardiac traces. Um, it's much higher frequency. Um, this can be analyzed. I think this is all. This is a very good recording. I mean, you could probably count the number of heartbeats. And then, you know, is it the raw? This is done with an oximeter. So this is 
reflectance probably of blood through your finger maybe anyway so is the raw intensity of these signals the relevant thing or is it more the rate so you have to convert this to rate which is a nonlinear transformation and maybe it's the rate that's more relevant to how it shows up in your fMRI data and then on and on and on but similar idea if this shows up in your fMRI data and it does how big is the fact how much of a problem is it are you worried your experiment is inducing large fluctuations in heart rate yeah, these are issues. I'm not sure I'm giving you real answers other than sketching out what the issues are. I mean, I don't use this for anything. I just, we save these and visually check at least that they're reasonable, but yeah, we don't do anything with them. So to follow up on that, so the reason why fMRI studies without respiration results are valid because although this can impact the gold signal drastically, so long as someone is not like hyperventilating or holding their breath, it, its effect on the gold relative to our subtractive path signal is relatively small. Is that? No, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I don't want to say false things, so I don't want to claim it's relatively small. But the theory, I mean, it could be relatively small. In fact, I mean, I'm sure there's papers that quantify this and so they could give you a real number. I don't know if it's small or large. It could be large. But the theory is it averages out, right? This kind of, sometimes you breathe in on these types of stimuli, but the next time you do it, you're like breathing out. And so it, in the end, just comes out in the wash is the theory. Whether it does, in fact, who knows? But, but you know, I mean, to play the glass half full view, like, it's not just, I mean, this, there are, there are many things like this, not just physiological things. Like, I mean, if you're a visual person, like, yeah, eye movements and they're closing their eyes, or if you're a cognitive person, their engagement, whatever that means might vary. Um, so it's not, that general problem is general and not specific to breathing per se. Yeah, no, I think your answer was, was very, very explanatory about it. It's kind of like random sample. We hope. Other, uh, I don't know, I guess we're talking about all of fMRI now, which is fine. Uh, other, everything you wanted to know about fMRI, but we're afraid to ask, whatever. Yeah. Go ahead. Is there any advantage or like special things on surface analysis? Is there anything special about surface analysis? Yeah, sort of. I mean, pros and cons, depending on, I mean, yeah. Okay, so the common, the common gripe about surface stuff is it can go wrong. Like, if you have bad surfaces, then everything's bad after that. So that's like a common, which is true. Like, that's why researcher has improved over the years. You know, if you have a crappy structural image, it's going to generate crappy results. And then why would you put your FMI results on a crappy surface? Like, yeah, that would be one line of argument against doing it. It also increases complexity. You have to think about surfaces, think about thickness um, of gray matter and visualization issues and all this other stuff. But um, is there any special advantage? I would say the main one is visualization. Like if you really care about spatial arrangement of brain areas like well i won't say volume like volumes are also important because anatomy is anatomy and you know where things are but you want to see and understand more symmetrical where that is on cortex like it's just so much easier to look at surfaces um, and there are other advantages you could argue like efficient use of the data like concentrating the data on the gray matter becomes easier and easier and things like that yeah, registration of people, arguably, I don't think it's the kind of the tool, but if you have good surfaces then, and you're actually in cortex and not subcortex, then it's much more natural to think of data as multiple surfaces than general forms. That's what makes more problems. So, what about the CR for session analysis and on these? Of the area and so it's like we have even if you have a small sphere, it goes into multiple mm -hmm. areas. And when you do volumetric, I guess then you play that. It's 
Can you see two separate activations with these not really two different cells? Right. Yep. Yep. I mean, I agree. Yeah. So partial volume is arguably reduced, is one way to summarize. Uh, yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, the brain fundamentally is, the cortex is fundamentally a surface and not a jello blob. <laughs> oh, oh, so one small thing, maybe this is a good discussion for the developers and this data. And we have problems with loading the data and it's really huge. So on the beta data, which combines that into whole sessions, um, it's just breaking the um, yeah. And it's, yeah, the, the only way I could load something was to just use this time series data we have because um, we have separate runs of data and yeah, those single runs load, but not this whole session. Yeah, um, so the basic issue is how do you grapple with massive files? Uh, <laughs> it's a uh, good so question. I, masking, I, I use just one single as fast as mask that you don't need to work. Yeah, so this is a very large, very important topic. Uh, it unfortunately depends on your exact coding setup, like your machine, the language, notebook versus cloud, all this stuff. Um, I don't know how to, I think I may have a slide deck on this. this. And I'll just, I'll summarize off the, I mean, I can also, I mean, this is actually on the web. Anyway, I can give it to Noah. But yeah, it's a super hard, complex, I'll call it an IT problem. You can, Let's say you have a huge file and it's you can let's say you can physically load it fit in RAM, but like you don't have much RAM after that. So once you load, you can downsample or only extract a small ROI and delete the rest. Um, another strategy is if it works for your statistic quantitative analysis, why not you can just analyze each session one at a time, get your answer, and then delete the data and then go on to the next session. Um, the space and format works, or well, the choice will affect how big the error if you load one millimeter of sample resolution that's massive, or you can load a one point, you know, a lower resolution, or you can load an FS average space, which is actually pretty. So that choice is a major determinant of how painful it will be. Uh, one thing we talk about on the data manual is like random access. So if you really only want a visual cortex or hippocampus. If you set up your data file right, and maybe nine Apple can do this, and I was looking at it, I would have to test it to make sure. If you have a four gigabyte data file and you only need 100K of it, it'd be crazy to unzip the whole thing and load the whole thing. That would take like minutes, right? Um, if, so if you have a good routine that can just sneak in and pull out that one slice of voxels or whatever, that can be super fast. And I have an example. Um, I have the map, I have the clone, I'm sure there's a Python for it. That's why we made HDF5 format binary file. Uh, these are just tensor, like XYZ trial. And you can, in 0.1 seconds, pull out you know, all the data for a small collection of boxes. Anyway, so that's another strategy to produce pain. But it really depends on your analysis. Like maybe you need the whole brain, in which case you can't do that. Or, yeah. And then one other general strategy is. Again, you bite the bullet, you load the entire session, but then you save out the small version of it that you need for later. Like extract only the gray matter voxels and uh, dump the trials you don't care about, and then save that out to a different file so that the next time you want to be analyzed, you just load that other file. Not the file. Yeah, so that's what I was saying. Like 90% of the work is just loading the data. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think I could ask Ariel to offer the 1.8 millimeter data. I think you don't have it yet. Yeah, and I know you want to use the data. Yeah, she might be one big part of this. Yeah, it's very large. So, um, yeah, the 1.8 would help you. Uh, 
Okay, so the general question is, I think you have different types of volumes and different resolutions. How do you kind of compare them? And maybe if we're talking about nuclear, so for example, how long is nuclear? Which is obviously uh, information. What is the information that you Sample. Yeah, so just to be clear, up sample means you're getting more data points. So um, it's like you can take two millimeter data with really low resolution and you can up sample it. Yeah, one yeah exactly. So, sorry, if you're down sample. Right. Uh, yeah, again, it depends on the situation, but in general, to save computational weight, you want to go as low as possible without losing too much information. So if your histology is at 0.5, if it's safe to say, there's this idea of aliasing too. So you want to smooth the 0.5 data and then downsample it. So it's like you have potentially a lot of information, but you want to basically get some of it, and then you can pull out what is the voxel and what's the other two numbers. But so if that fits what you're trying to do, great. Then you can take the high, super high resolution 0.5 and smooth and downsample it so that it's two millimeter, and then you're like easy. Uh, but it really depends. Like if there are fine scale features in histology that you Really care about then what you really want to do is analyze the high resolution data and get a quantity that's meaningful like density or whatever and that's a number and then maybe that is downtown the pool it's certainly valid to upsample the two millimeter data like there's no problem other than it makes your computer yeah um consider uh, artificially at the ending yeah, so it is, but it depends on how you treat it. So if you upsample data, yeah, this is a major important issue. Like voxels are never independent. So you never, you know, if you have 100 voxels in ROI and then you upsample to 1,000 voxels, so to speak, like nothing's changed. So it's not like you gain 10 times more power. So I guess you should. Shouldn't think of voxels as independent. So if you don't do that, then this avoids the problem that you alluded to. But if you were of the mindset that voxels somehow did contribute statistical power, then yeah, it would be a problem if you upsampled your data because obviously it's no, it's not, it's just fake. Uh, does that make sense? Maybe I was just thinking of the different algorithms that you can. Up sample your data, so depending on that, different voxels would be uh, it would become one voxel would become four, <laughs> one say it's one. Yeah, so in general, up sampling, yeah, that is a can of worms because you can choose what you're saying, how many, what resolution should I up sample to? That's like choice, and then there's the method or like interpolation method, and yeah, that will change what your data are like. and uh yeah there's no different methods do different things make different assumptions and some methods are more computationally intensive linear is very fast things beyond linear are slower but arguably more accurate uh yeah we would have to stare at exactly what data problem you're staring facing with but yeah that's a you should be aware of at least what you're doing and in general yeah you don't want to do linear unless you really pressed for speed there is no consensus currently. Well, I would say that the general understanding is yeah, higher order interpolation methods are generally going to give you better results, but this is not like a accurate, it's still a lossy process. It's like it's almost guessing. It's almost like guessing what would have the value been. And you don't really know, but the interpolation higher order interpolation methods are probably better guesses than linear, for example. Yes. Oh, global signal regression. I actually don't know too much about it. I only learned through osmosis um, and like what I hear. So take whatever I'm about to say with half a grain of salt. Um, I think the fundamental issue that people see is in fMRI data, and this applies to both the resting state and an experimental data set, 
uh, there is a massive quote global signal, meaning like all of gray matter seems to have some component of their signals that kind of go up and down together. So then the question is, why is that like a neurally driven thing that's therefore interesting, arguably, or is it some artifactual source or a mixture of both? <laughs> it could be both. Uh, okay, so without resolving this cause of it, I guess the existence of this thing is going to show up as massive widespread, say pairwise regional correlations or voxel correlations for that matter. So it'll show up like this massive effect in, if you're staring at pairwise correlations. Um, so I guess the controversy is maybe one camp thinks it's largely artifactual, for example, head motion related or something. Uh, and if you believe that, then you want to get rid of it. And then one idea to get rid of it is global signal regression, which is take a time series that's basically the mean of the entire brain and in a sense, regress it out from each voxel's time series. Uh, if I think that's a fair summary of what people have been contemplating. And so, yeah, you could do it. And yeah, that'll totally change the observed apparent correlations between voxels. Uh, but maybe the controversy is not everyone agrees that maybe that's like too aggressive. Like if there's some important global neural signal, then obviously that method will throw it away. That's my understanding of what the controversy is. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has insight, but. I, I think it's fair to say everyone agrees at least some substantial fraction of that phenomena is artifactual. Like humans move their heads and scanner have gradient heating problems and whatever, like there are so at least everyone agrees, at least part of it is artifactual, but maybe the controversy is on what's left. And if, if all of it's artifactual or is there um, some signal? Yes, push. Um, there's a uh, talk about, uh, what you think about like, what is spontaneous gold signal for? What does it mean? <laughs> oh, that's an interesting question. That's, yeah, that's, uh, I actually have some projects related to that. Um, what is it doing? I mean, people have different theories. Uh, some people think of it as just kind of like a reliable structural index. Like not every neuron talks to every neuron. You have certain brain areas, there's certain white matter tracks and the so-called spontaneous activity is just a proxy for that structure, right? That's kind of one kind of viewpoint. Another viewpoint, is this what you're fishing for? Just like theories of what, yeah, okay. Um, another one is, um, and by the way, I mean, you can measure neurons directly and they will spontaneously chatter away. So it's not a hemodynamic artifact fully. <laughs> um, other theories like treat it as, um, I give it a more central role in actual cognition, so like, prediction or you're internally sampling possible cognitive thing, cognitive states or even sensory states, something like that. Um, you could treat it in just a straightforward fashion. Like let's say you do a five minute resting scan. What are you gonna do in the scanner? I'm going to, I don't know. If it were me, I would think about the scanning environment and how weird it is and think about things I'm doing later. <laughs> so in that sense, it's not spontaneous at all. It's just, Spontaneous from the point of view of the experimenter. So that's maybe another camp. Um, I don't know. Maybe those are the dominant ones, but uh, maybe one more. Maybe it's just like a biophysical artifact. Like your neurons are like wet things, like biological messy things, and they won't they won't shut up, but they'll just fire away spontaneously from a sort of, they will spike randomly because voltage fluctuations and stuff like that. Uh, I'm just making that up basically. I have no idea if anyone really believes that, but it, that, that treats it more like a physics bug. <laughs> so it could be all of the above, who knows? <laughs> Any one last thing before we close out any random fMRI question?